The following is a teaching by Thamo Naidu. Thamo provides oversight to the Gate Global Family of Churches and is the founder and senior elder of Gate Ministry Santon, Gauteng, South Africa. His ministry calls the church to return to accurate biblical patterns and to raise up the sons of God to represent Christ in the earth. I'm going to start wrapping up the series even though this, this present series, you cannot put an amen to the conclusion of it. It is, it is an unending process of growing into the knowledge of the Lord. I'm at that point in the series where I'm trying to now make the, your understanding of the Divine Father a very practical reality. Um, as I told you last week, that um, everything in heaven must manifest on the earth. Everything invisible must become visible. Everything that has a spiritual connotation to it must become a, a practical reality. In fact, you cannot call yourself a son of God if you, if you do not identify with a person whom you can refer to, I'm a son of a man. Son of God, son of man. This is the two dimensions that completes things. You cannot talk about heaven without relating it to the earth, and neither can you talk about the earth without relating it to the heavens. This is a kind of a conjugal connection. And these elements of seeing these two dimensions, uh, uh, they become an amazing reality uh, to all of us. So, so while we are talking about the Divine Father, that Father has to be mirrored in the earth. It has to be replicated or represented on the earth. And God always uses mediums through which he communicates himself. This is a corporeal principle. I've highlighted it repeatedly. In fact, I cannot read the scriptures without developing these concepts that becomes the lenses through which I understand uh, the deeper things of God. And the corporeal principle is that God chooses to remain in a place called Sabbath rest, but if he, he wants to work actively, he does it through a person or people that he chooses. Whom shall we send who will go for us? While God can do things without people, he chooses people through which he establishes his purposes. And that was highlighted for us when Jesus took a bowl of water and washed the feet of his disciples um, because he wanted to make beautiful the feet of those who will carry the good news into the nations of the world. So God uses people. Say to your neighbor, God uses people. This is something you have to understand. The mystical gospel says, I don't need anybody. God will speak to me directly. You know, but the, the pragmatic gospel is very simple. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The sad part with religious people who have superstitious mindsets, I hope there's none here, is that while the word wants to become flesh, they want to, they want to extract the word from the flesh. They want to, we, we are trying to demystify uh, our understanding of Christ, but most people want to mystify it. And that's how you create this dichotomous and, 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 and a kind of a separation between the spiritual and, and the practical. God wants to dwell amongst these people. And so when God does that, he, use, he brings, he raises up a son. In these last days, Hebrews chapter one, God does not speak through the medium of prophets to us, but God speaks in the Son. And when God speaks in the Son, that, that Son is a very composite, complex construct. Um, that Son is a picture of a corporate family uh, called the Ecclesia, the Church of Jesus Christ. And that family is made up of fathers and sons that are supposed to represent uh, the, the, or, or, or mimic the way Christ, um, that's Jesus, functioned in relationship with his father. Uh, that's the model. That's the model. 
So God places us in families, and, and while we all are sons of God, he makes us fathers in an environment. You cannot be a son of God without becoming a father. All of us here. Uh, I was once a, a son to, to my parents, and now I'm a father to children. And that's the principle of life. And I, I read it to you from the genealogical list, and I've shown you, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, that God took 14, uh, 14 I think, chapter, uh, uh, verses to first set the lineage of Jesus before he tells us about the birth of Jesus. 14, uh, well, it's three times 14 uh, generations. That's 42 uh, stages of development before he tells you, and now this is the birth of Jesus Christ, and this is the historical record of how he was born. So none, none of us just fall out of the heavens. We all are born through a lineage, through a family group. The point I'm making here is that if we are the sons of God, then the only thing we as sons should do is make our father visible. We are here to, to, to bring people to our father. Yeah. People, when they look at you, they must not see son. They must see the image of your father in you. A son of God is the exact representation or exact image of his father. So even in every facet of your lives, in every facet of your lives, the primary objective of the church, wherever you are, in business, uh, in whatever vocational call, you could be still, you know, in a classroom, growing up, educating yourself, um, or in university, wherever you are, your primary purpose is to make your father visible. We never draw attention to ourselves. We always draw attention to the one that is above us. Are you understanding this? And when you are leading people, you should never lead them like a, like a, like a very difficult taskmaster. You can be tough. You can be, you can be, you can be strong in terms of giving leadership. But the primary objective of your leadership is to bring the spirit of your father into the environment in which you are functioning. And that spirit, uh, you know, is a spirit of love. Uh, and in love, there is discipline, there's correction. I've often said it from this book, but there's two arms to love. One is a tender arm, where it's embracing, endearing, uh, it's encouraging, it's edificational. And there are other times where there is a tough side to that love. It's not just tender, but it's tough, because if, if a father loves, a father corrects, a father disciplines. But when you do it, you do not do, not do it maliciously, you do not do it um, uh, harshly, you do it from a heart of love, even though it may be perceived to be a kind of a very harsh or, or tough way of expressing love. So the principle I'm making is, the point I'm making is, is that every one of us, no matter where we are, we should display the love of our Father. The spirit of our Father should be upon us. That when we bring that spirit, the blessings of God comes into those environments and God is exalted. Are you hearing me? And I've, re I've read enough scriptures to highlight that. But let me, let me just leave one with you, John 1 verse 18. No one has ever seen God. Everyone say, no one has ever seen God. <laughs> so even if you've, you had an epiphany, or you, you, know, you had an experience with God, what you've not seen God, you've seen how he chose to address himself when he appears to you. But no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Uh, the principle here is that sons of God lead the invisible Father into visibility. Sons of God make God visible. 
makes the Father visible. So wherever you are, you must be a good example of your Father. When people look at you, they must say, you and your Father are just the same. And, and many of them must be fatally attracted to us when they come to the place of studying us, they must be able to say, can I get to know your father? And that's where the principle of adoption kicks in. And the principle of adoption is that we then lead people from just living as independents as, and as slaves, we now lead them into the family of our father, and that's what we call salvation. Salvation is not being saved from hell to go to heaven. Salvation at its, at its, at its basis is that you are being saved from living an independent, isolated life to now learning how to live in a family where God becomes your father and you enjoy all the benefits of being in such an august, such a great family of God. This is a critical aspect. So sons of God must mirror the image of the father. Everything the father does, a son must emulate it. That's why for us to get to that place, God puts certain people in your life, and I'll talk about that later. He puts people in your life so that the, a, a, a transfer can take place. God puts grace in somebody's life so I can share it with others. You know, I was in Cape Town this weekend and I got back last night, and on Saturday I met with all my sons, you know, in a hotel for, for about four hours, sitting around a table and just, just sharing the grace of God in me. Uh, and that grace comes through the word of his grace. And, uh, and as I share it with them, they start to get the impartations. They get the transferals. They get the counsel so that some of them had their own networks. So they can go now and share that grace with others. And in that way, we mirror God to each other. Are you hearing me today? This is how it happens. Uh, you know, Adam was, not, you know, if you really study Adam being the son of God uh, in Luke 3.38, you will find that that list, it, 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 it can be weaved throughout every period of history until it comes to Jesus, the son of God. You know, or from Jesus, that list can be traced back to the first man that lived on the earth. Adam, and that man is connected to God as son of God. Are, are you understanding what I'm saying? So everyone is playing a, a role in the continuation or the unbroken succession of the grace that we refer to as the image and likeness of God. And we all have to play a role. Some of you are extremely influential people. You sit on top of the pile. You have executive privileges you have rights, you have people that, that are under you. And um, if you want to be everything God wants you to be, then you have to be a reflection of your father. And that's where I want to get to. Because it's not about just coming to a spiritual household and seeing Thamo as your father uh, and me being, being your spiritual covering or whatever you want to call it. That's, if, if it was just about that, then that would be idolatry to be vanity. The idea is how do you take the same spirit and then you carry it into the places that, of your influence and you transfer that spirit from the lives of people because what's the, well, you know, if we really had to cut to the core problems of human society, you'll find that it is that people have an identity crisis. They don't know who they are. And, and they are insecure because they don't know who they are. Uh, and their insecurity is based on the fact that they've not found true love, true love. But when you bring that love uh, to them, their security, and then you can connect them to the love of God because, uh, because only He lavishes us with that love. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And the Bible says He lavished it on us. I mean, he didn't just give it to us proportionately. He gave it to us in such a way that it's immeasurable. 
Uh, that's why when, when Paul speaks about the love of God, it's height, it's worth. And I know we sing these songs and they become so simple. But, you know, we are trying to talk about how do you measure the love of God? I mean, it, it, it's immeasurable. You can't calculate it. You can't even, you can't put a, you know, a, a description to it. This is, this is God's love that he could bring us, bring us to enjoy his family in such an intimate and personal way. And now we must take the same love and share it with others. Are you understanding? And that's why parables like the man who was for, forgiven of billions by today's standards, uh, monetary standards, billions of rands. And then, then uh, and he, when he remembered that somebody owed him a little bit, owed him a little bit of money, he put the guy in jail. He forgot that he got forgiven of billions. But he, he took somebody to court when the guy owed him a few rand. You think about it. It's hypocrisy. It's double standards. And I see it in the church. I see it in the church. A guy is quick to take somebody to the law or to report somebody, but they forgot how much they were forgiven, how much they were cared for, how much they were loved for. And that's why this message, we have to now earth it. And earthing it means that if you could be a recipient of the love of your father, how much more you should share that love with the people in your vicinity. And, and when that happens, the finger pointing will stop. Judgmentalism will stop. Looking down at people will stop. In fact, you will now start to operate from a place called true humility. I'm not talking about a pietistic form of humility, a vain form of humility, but I'm talking about true humility, where you realize, well, if it wasn't for what I received, I'd never be where I am. And you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and that's how he promotes us. He exalts us amongst the people that we work with. So whatever you do, whatever you do, you must remember that your father will walk in and through you. So wherever I go, I'm not trying to put Thamo on display uh, or try to mimic a form of sonship. Wherever I go, I'm saying, God, you have to be in me. And God comes to me through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, who puts his seal on me. That's what Jesus said. He said, I will send the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you orphans, John chapter 14. And when the Spirit comes to you, we, the Father and Son, will make our dwelling place in you. So through the Spirit, which is called the Spirit of Adoption, the Father and Son comes and dwells amongst, in us, and we become God's house. And you can call that a mansion. We become God's mansion, Monet. And, uh, and so now God is in me. So if God is in me now, wherever I go, I'm taking him. I'm dragging him along with me. You know, wherever I go, he's working in me. I've become his workmanship, but in me, he's producing good works. That's what the Bible says in, John, in Matthew chapter 5. It says, you know, let your light so shine amongst men that they may see, that they may see your good works, your employment, your profile, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Can you see that? That's how the church was supposed to function, it was originally designed to function. Not this thing with standing on some street corner and shouting out to people that if you don't repent, you're going to go to hell. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that we won't warn them about hell, but, but, uh, but that's not the way the evangelism was supposed to take place. The evangelism was to share the gospel. And the gospel is not bad news. The gospel is good news. And the good news is that, that you can immediately be translated into the family of heaven. And, and, that, and that your father then will be there for you all the way. All the way. So that's where we want to go to. So, so the father must walk in each one of us. Say to your neighbor, the father must walk in you. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 17. He said, my father is always at his work to this very day, 
and I too am working. My father's always at his work. He's referring to himself, that my father's working in me, and that's how I work. Um, verily, tr very truly, I tell you, verse 19, the son can do nothing by himself. Come to that place of vulnerability. I mean, this is the eternal logos. This is the transcendental God who has omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, saying, I can't do anything. In a human body, he says, the son cannot do anything by himself. He can, only, he can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. You will be amazed. Now, I think, I think all of this has to come. You know, sometimes I feel like we're being, we're being distracted by all these secular teachings. Please, I'm not anti-coaching, mentoring. Some of us want guides. You know, all these secular terms. It's taking us to an Egyptian mode of representation or effective uh, uh, function in human society. And, uh, and sometimes I think these are, these are, uh, are traps and snares by the enemy because, because we don't understand the ethos and the culture of the kingdom of heaven. And as a result, we'd rather go and pay you know, thousands of dollars to go and get all of these uh, uh, these uh, tools, uh, you know, to make us more effective in life. Whereas, here's a son who was not coached, yet he was very active in his demonstration that whatever he does is because he's connected to his father. Are you hearing me? Now, I'm not saying you don't need to go for these courses. Go if you can learn. Go if you can learn. But if it supplants and replaces the culture of the kingdom, then that's demonic. That's idolatry. Now please, I know some of you now are gonna get mystical on me. I'm trying to demystify you, so next time you get invited to a course, you're gonna say, no, I'm not going. No, I'm not saying that. You can learn from the sciences of the Chaldeans. You can go and learn, but don't embrace something that will replace what the Spirit of God wants to do in us. You understanding what I'm saying? Don't get the wrong markings on your forehead. Uh, make sure that you are marked right. And that's why Jesus would say in verse 36 of John 5, I have a testimony, testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I'm doing, testify that the Father has sent me. Testify. So I want all of us, even though I'm going to speak specifically to how this house becomes a reservoir of grace, where you can come and draw from a patriarchal world, like the early um, patriarchs dug wells, and their sons would come and drink out of it, and the herd will drink out of it. This is a well. This house is a well. And it's a wellspring of blessings. If you come here, you should not be, become intoxicated with something that is carnal and secular. If you come here, you must know that you're drinking pure waters. You're drinking something that will not corrupt or contaminate you. Uh, I'd like to think that if you come to a house like this, you can come with, with empty sacks every week to receive grain to feed the world that you live in, to sustain your own spheres of influence. That's what I'd like to think. I'd like to think that when you come here, you would come to discover the unsearchable riches of Christ and that you will start living a life that, help, that will help you to be better people out there. I wouldn't like to think that you're coming here just to mark yourself present on a Sunday so that the devil won't attack you on a Monday or you'll be cursed. If that's the case, stay at home. Stay at home. You're not going to be cursed. I mean, don't stay at home. And I'm not telling you to stay at home. <laughs> because some of you like that. You like that. 
Not yet, I'm talking about there. <laughs> the point I'm making is that if you come here, you're coming to drink from a well. Uh, you're drinking from a patriarchal world, a world that has been dug by a father, by fathers. And we are always connecting to the, the, to the ancient of days, to the, the fathers, uh, to the forefathers of our faith. But you're coming here to receive the grace that will make you better people. And when you go out there, that which you received, you freely share. That's what the Apostle Paul said, that which I received, I am now sharing with you. That's what you should be doing. Obviously, obviously, I tell the guys in my circles that I will give it to you in chunks, especially when we do apostolic schools and POAs. I'm there not to give people the seven steps to success or something. I'll just throw the stuff out. But you know, it's like when you go and buy flour. You know, flour, you call it flour when you make bread, flour, okay, from a store. And then you decide how you're gonna prepare it for your family. And some of you may bake a, a loaf of bread, some of you may make some, some chapati, and others of you may, may use the flour for other things that you wanna prepare. But you would have to now learn how to take, take what you receive from this well, from this house, and then you must bake it to suit the environment that you are in. You must be able to cut it up in the way your people can eat it. That's what the Bible says when the Bible says that, the, that wisdom in, in, in Proverbs chapter nine, wisdom builds the house. Wisdom builds whatever house, your business house, you know, your career, the, the, your vocational, uh, uh, life, wherever you are, whatever it is, wisdom builds it. But wisdom has to uh, also uh, slaughter a, a, a sheep, a, a, a cow. Uh, uh, she has to, wisdom needs to know how to c uh, cut her meat. And, and some of us, you know, you buy a whole huge, you know, piece of meat from the butcher, but you can't just force feed it on a child that's five years old you may have to cut it up into small pieces. Wisdom knows how to cut it. And others of us, we can eat a whole kg one time and still feel hungry after that. <laughs> but um, the point is that you must learn how to cut this now. You must know how to mix your wine, uh, which simply means that you need to know, you know, on what level you share it with your people. Uh, and. Um, and this is what Paul says to the church, in, uh, to the Hebrew, uh, if he wrote the book of Hebrews, that is. He said, you know, to the mature, we share meat, but to those that are still developing, we share milk. He's not, he's not, he's not trying to cast uh, a stigma or a negative connotation to those that are immature. He's basically saying that not everybody has the same capacity, and you must know on what level to share the things that are being shared. So, but the principle is that if you come to this house, you're coming to a family. You're coming to a family. And you're coming to a family that will feed you. And you must then take the food you receive and you must share it with others. And if you do this right, you will see blessings coming. Tremendous blessings. Yet, let me show you something. Because when you return to the spirit of fathering, I, I'll give you a, 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 I'm going to make a statement. I'll make a statement. I could be proven wrong, but I don't think so. If the true spirit of the father comes back into the environment of your world, your business, your career, the job you have, and you just may be not even an influential person, but you bring that love in that world that you live in. I can guarantee you prosperity will come to that world. I'm not a guy that will name it and claim it. I'm not a prosperity preacher. You give to get. Uh, you know, you sow, you sow. I believe in sowing. I, I do a lot of sowing. And it comes back, you know, in manifold ways. So I'm not anti-giving. But I'm not, a, I'm not a prosperity guy in that sense. But I believe that you can create systemic presence. I believe 
You can create the systems that can infect your environment. Are you hearing me? And if you do it right, there'll be no famine in your land. Even the widow will say, I'm covered. And the orphan will say, I have a father. Are you hearing me? There will be no striving and begging for things. But the spirit, the spirit of the father has to come. Let me read something for you. Isaiah chapter 3. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah. Listen to what he takes away. And this is a judgment on the nation of Israel because they went and created, they created cisterns, C-I-S-T-E-R-N, which we will call systems today, okay? We will call it systems. Uh, they created things that were not biblical. They did not have a biblical design to it. And they became authors of their own destiny. And because they decided that they will, they will become architects uh, designing their own systems, which was anti-God, anti the way God wanted to bless the people, they pressed the self-destruct button. And they brought upon themselves so many problems. Now it is in that background these, this portion of scripture is coming. Because how many houses are lacking today? How many houses amongst us are living like beggars? How many of us get paid tomorrow and by the end of the week you got nothing? Where is the principle that Elijah introduced the widow to that your flour will not run, your, 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 your containers that have the flour will not run dry and the cruise of oil in your house will never stop flowing until the famine is over. Where's the principle that if you know how to serve the Lord, you know, if you know how to give your life to God in obedience, that it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. These are not, these are not unreachable principles. These are real principles, real principles. Why is it that we can't survive? We we'll have to battle, struggle, hustle. I used the word hustle in Kenya the other day. I didn't know the president of Kenya used it as a slogan for his elections. <laughs> and, um, you know, scheming, pleading poverty. Where did we go wrong? I'll tell you where we went wrong. We killed the root. And who's the root? Fathers. Well, who's the branch? Sons. If the root is dead, the branch dies. If the root is dead, the tree can't give you fruit. Listen to this. This is what God says, because we chose our own inventions. We've concocted our own ideas. The Lord says the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, I'll take it away. It'll dry up. That's why when there's an absence of fathers, there's famine in the land. Study the scriptures. Study the scriptures. The mighty man and the man of war. Now remember what I'm saying here. You can be a father in the house and not carry the spirit of the father. So you're just the gender called male, functioning as a husband and a father to your kids, but because the spirit of the heavenly father is not upon you. And that father, that spirit is a, is a spirit of provision, of sus sustenance. It's a, it's a spirit of, of preservation and protection, of immunity, of longevity. It's actually a spirit of life. You get the Midas touch when this corporate anointing comes back to the church. Listen to what he says. The mighty man and the man of war the judge and the prophet, and the diviner and the elder, the captain of the 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and the skillful artisan, and the expert enchanter. All of these different administrative gifts will be removed. And listen to this. 
And what will be replacing that? I will give children to be their princes. No more fathers. The, so one, one version says boy leaders. You can be 80 years old and behave like a boy. Boy leaders. I'll, I'll give immature people to lead you. And babes shall rule over you, over them. The people will be oppressed, everyone by another, and everyone by his neighbor. I mean, I think these are some of the root causalities to the problems we have in the world today. You can go study any society, you'll see major problems. The, the world is in serious trouble. You don't have to go far, just study South Africa. You will find that these are the root problems. And if this house wants to be a blessed house, we must get back to the principles that God wants us to have. It says here, the child will be everyone by another, the people will be oppressed, everyone by another, and everyone by his neighbor. The child will be insolent towards the elder. Even children will, will show indifference, uh, insubordination to their fathers and the base towards the honorable. When a man takes hold of his brother, because now there's no more fathers in the land, so you look for your charismatic brother. That's what happened in the days when David became old and he couldn't function as king. He lost his heat. Um, uh, and then, then brothers started to elect brothers. And fathers were absent until until God intervened. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father saying, you have clothing, you be our ruler. In other words, you have the charisma. And let these ruins be under your power. In that day he will, say, he will, he will protest saying, that's the appointed leader. I cannot cure your ills. For in my house is neither food nor clothing. How do you want me to rule over you when I am suffering like you? Okay, I see it in church circles. I see this because people reject fathers over households. Those households become, you know, just indigent households. It always, that's why we have to spend so much of time talking about money. We have to plead and beg some places I go, they want to take three offerings. One place I went to in my early days of traveling, seven offerings. Those poor people. Those poor people. Why? Because we don't understand the spirit of fathering, the grace of God. I cannot cure your ills, your ills for in my house is neither food nor clothing. Do not make me a ruler of the people. And Jerusalem stumbled. And Judah has fallen. Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. To provoke the eyes of his glory. The look on their countenance witnesses against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul. For they have brought evil upon themselves. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them. This is God speaking. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with them. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. As for my people. Look at the language. My people. This is God's own special people. This is God speaking affectionately about his family. Children are their oppressors and women rule over them. My people, this is what's happening. Now please, God is not being chauvinistic here by saying women rule over them. But it says because there's no fathers, we have to create a matriarchal culture. There's an absence of fathers. Oh my people, those who lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. But what does God do? Like in Psalm 23, he's my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me in the parts of, in the parts, plural. Many different trajectories of righteousness. He gives me compliant path.
patterns of how I should live my life, and fathering is one of it. So today, we as the church of Jesus Christ, we as a church, have to come back to understanding that we are defined by families, and families are defined by fathers. And I'm not talking about Thamo the father, because Thamo grew up in a culture of orphans. I mean, I had overseers and superintendents when I was in the denomination and trained. We had good teachers and professors, but we never knew the grace of fathering. So we had to cut our teeth in the, in the places where we made errors and so many blunders. But now that God has baptized us into his name. And you know, I was saying this to the, to the POA in Cape Town yesterday. You know, the Bible says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I, it stumbled upon me. I got up yesterday morning, early in the morning, and I couldn't sleep. And the Lord said to me, have you noticed the pattern in which I do things? And he said to me, read Matthew 28, 18 again. And I saw it for the first time, that everything that God wants to put first, I mean, sometimes God starts with last things before he comes to first things. Now, in the Godhead, God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Am I correct? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yet, the first thing God introduced us to is the Spirit. And the Spirit then introduced us to the Son. And now we're moving to a place where the Son is introducing us to the Father. And as we are baptized in the water of his word, we're getting to understand the complexity of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're getting to understand what powerful insights there are when you function as sons of God. But for the first time, at least in my 30 years of ministry, 40 years of ministry, for the first time, I am beginning now to get baptized or marinated or pickled in understanding who the Father is in my life. I'm beginning to understand now that it's not a cultural thing. You can't go to your tribal village or to your homestead or to my little town called Peter Marisberg to study my grandfather to know about my father. You understand? You, you, because all of them, at some st stage in their development, probably had a dysfunctional or deficient understanding of fathering. And, and they may have been limited, even though they may have been loving towards us. I'm not in any way denigrating them. But yet, at the same time, I'm beginning to know now that unless I study him by looking into the mirror of his word, I will not become like him. Are you hearing me today? And, f and the Lord said to me, I first introduced you to the Spirit. I brought you to understand sonship. But now I'm taking you to the quintessence of the matter, which is that you're going to have to have your forehead carry the name of Father, even though you understand yourself as his son. Are you understanding? So now God is bringing us into this dimension. And, and, and fathers define families. I told you this, that the name Father in the Greek is pater. But the root word for pater, and from the word pater comes the word patria, which is for family. So you cannot have family without father. And without father, families do not carry definition. So in this house, we want to, the next phase of the journey of this house must be that the, that the grace and the spirit of our father, who is the father of glory, becomes such a predominant grace upon you that whenever people touch you as a son of God, they feel your father, they taste your father, they sense your father in everything you do. Now this is where we're moving to. And this is what I want to see this house armed with. You know, um, Genesis 14 verses 1 to 17 is a good story, but and you know the story, it's, it's been discussed so many times here, when Abraham had to go and rescue Lot, but in verse 13, then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the, 
the Amorite, brother of Eskel, and brother of Anna, and they were allies with, a, uh, with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother, listen to this, was taken captive, he armed his 300. He armed, everyone say armed. That word armed is not a word like you put a weapon, you weaponize your, your 318 soldiers, um, 318 trained servants, um, like you put an AK-47 in each one of their hands. That's not, maybe he put weapons like swords and knives in those days, or spears. But I think it was more than that. The word armed means that Abraham learned how to impart his spirit, how to transfer that which was in him upon the 318. It was like, like he produced 318 Abra Abrams. That's what he did. He, 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 there was a transfer that took place. And, and you become the company you keep. Are, are you understanding? Um, uh, if you live in a certain land long enough, you take on the accent of the people that speak the, the language of that land. You take on the behavioral patterns. You take an, a, a South African, you put them in the United States of America, they stay there, well some, they stay there for two weeks, they come back with an accent. <laughs> Others, it may take you know, 20 years before they start to speak like the people of that land. Similarly, if you stay in a house of fathers, if you stay in a house that is strongly led by a father, then you are guaranteed to carry the spirit of that father. Are you understanding? That's not cloning. Say to your neighbor, that's not cloning. That's called impartational transfers. You become the environment you live in. You get shaped by that environment and you start to operate in it. So he armed these 318 trained servants who were born, born in his own house. These, these were not people living everywhere. They lived, they were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So the, the point I'm making is that when fathers play a predominant role in an environment, that environment shapes the behavior of everyone in the house. And that's how you become a prodigy to that environment. Uh, fathers invest in sons. This is a very important point. I don't want to invest in buildings even though we need the facilities. I want to invest in people. I think some of my biggest builds in all my traveling uh, is uh, around tables where Sometimes we have to book a hotel room, book meals, and it's, it becomes exorbitant amounts, huge amounts. But I believe that if you don't create the environment, the culture, you can't transfer the grace. So we invest a lot in people. I, I believe that the greatest investment you can make is in people. Uh, and in the Church of Jesus Christ, people are our biggest business. I mean it in a good sense. Our business is to serve people, to minister to people, to provide a meal for them, so that in that environment they can enjoy the blessings of God. So fathers invest in sons. Jesus invested three and a half years of his ministry in 12 disciples, who later on became, who became apostles. The Bible tells us these disciples, if you went and read Luke 6, 12 to 16 and Acts 4, 13, they had been with Jesus, with Jesus. There has to be some kind of a transfer connectivity. Uh, you can call it a conjugal relationship. You can call it a covenantal relationship. You can call it an allegiance uh, but it, must be some, uh, but it must be a relationship built on freedom where there's an investment that takes place. You cannot see yourself anymore as just coming to a house. You have to learn what the woman with the issue of blood did. You have to press through the crowd. Around, look at everyone here. This is the crowd, even though it's our family. It's a crowd. But you have to press through until you learn how to touch the hem of the garment until you learn how to get the virtue, 
that was on him transferred to you. That's what the lady did. And that day, she was healed. She was healed. The pressing, the persevering, the connection is a critical aspect to impartations, which the word is God imputes his grace to us. And the imputation of grace is how God installs, deposits his purposes. And, and when, you, when fathers invest in their sons, they, they help sons to find their placement. You know, we, read, we heard from Dr. Kefil word today um, that, that, that Naomi was in the wrong place. And, and the decision was made by her husband, uh, when her husband, uh, what's his name, Elimelech, when Elimelech made a bad decision to leave the house, the, the city of his father, he left the city of his father, called the city of David, Bethlehem, and went to the land of Moab. And when he went to the land of Moab, it's a land that, that denigrates and mocks the idea of patriarchy. Moab, who? Ab, father, who needs a father? And there, all the men, all the fathers were killed. Okay? But she had to make a decision. If I stay here, I will continue to be a widow, and I will be purposeless in my life. But if I move and position myself accurately, maybe, maybe my shame can be redeemed. And that's how Boaz became a kinsman redeemer. But here's the point. She said to her two daughters-in-law, she said, go back to your mother's house. She never said, go back to your father's house. Because in the environment of Moab, fathers are not elevated, but mothers are exalted. And uh, there was an absence of a fathering grace. But, but Ruth was was savvy enough, was sharp enough to make a calculated decision. I had refused to marry a man, go back and find another husband, because he will also suffer the same effects in this land of fatherlessness. So she chose to go with her. She said, where you go, I go. Your people will be my people, and so forth. And she, when she made that that move, and remember, you know, this is not about cold love or, or romance that we're talking about here. We're talking about preserving seed. This, the culture of the Old Testament uh, narratives are completely different to the way we perceive marriage today. Marriage today was never designed to function the way we design it. Uh, the biblical way was, how do I raise up a son to become a father? How does my womb capture seed to be able to produce longevity and continuity in, the, in life. And when Ruth got a, a position right, then she found covering under uh, Boaz. And as a result of that, she carried a seed that will ultimately give birth to Jesus Christ. Are you understanding what I'm saying here today? Positioning is right. Tell your neighbor positioning is right. And when you get to know your father, you actually get to know the setting on your compass. This is how calibra calibration and frequency adjustments take place. When you know your father's house, you know that you're not a drifter. I'm fascinated even with drunk people. The guy can be passed out on the street, but he'll get up and he'll smell his way home. Even a drunk man knows his father's house. And most of us, we don't know because we move from church to church, from music to music, from one good preacher to another good preacher, from one nice church building to another church building. We don't understand who is my father. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And that's why we got this migrant culture in the world today. But when fathers are restored and you feel connected, then portions of the scripture like Numbers chapter 1, Numbers chapter 2 become a reality because every man has to find his father's house and when he finds his father's house, he finds his banner, his motto, his alma mater, he finds uh, 
uh, where he belongs. He finds now that that's where his skill sets will best be used and so forth. And he also finds his location in a four square camp setting, which is a picture of the city of God. So these are very, very important things. The other thing about fathers, and this is something you have to do even in your business, is to invest in people. You must build your business, your career, your department, whatever you call yourself, you must build a family there. Build a family. You don't have to say, I'm the father. You don't have to even use the familiar language we're using here. But the spirit in what you do, of, of what you do must be the spirit that inculcates and generates this whole spirit of family. That even if a person is an alien and a stranger, they will feel loved and accepted in your home. Are you understanding? That's the culture. And let me tell you, if you get this right, if you, if you build family by raising the sons of God, um, then you will, you'll be able to do some great things for God. Even Jesus understood that family could not be defined uh, biologically or by your bloodline but it had to be defined by those who love God and do his will. You can read this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, um, where he asks, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my father? Uh, he that does the will, you know, he who loves me. Just put it on the board, Matthew 12, 50, 5, 0. Um, uh, and, and these are very, very important aspects. Uh, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Can you see that? It, it, it re-socializes the concept of family. It resets how you define family. And, and these are very important aspects. And that does not mean that the, that the Corbin principle kicks in. The Corbin principle is, is a principle that the, Jew, the priest used when they said they've devoted them now to another spiritual entity called the family of God, and they're serving God's purposes in the temple, and then people will, and then there was a charge brought to them saying, you're neglecting your natural parents. And then they would, they would use this Corbin principle. They would say, no, but now we are serving God. And Jesus said, if you ever use the principle by neglecting your natural parents, then you will be cursed. That's what Jesus said. In other words, while you have a family, you know, I have a natural family, even though my spiritual family is very important to me, that's us. And our global family of churches is very important to us. Uh, I flew to Alaska for two days. It cost me a fortune to get there just to visit somebody who was very close to me, Leon Brown, who's got cancer. For me, that was more important than preaching. I canceled, I changed, I stopped, I, I canceled going to speak at the Madison Gardens to go and visit somebody for two days. And jump back, it took me three days to get back. Um, that's more important to me. Family must be so important in the natural and even in the spiritual. Are you understanding what I'm saying? We don't dishonor our natural parents, but we also must know how to value my brother and sister in the Lord because we are sharing one father. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is so critical to me. So it's, it's very, very important today that, you, that we start to bring the spirit of fathering back into this house and that the spirit of fathering starts to generate the culture that God wants us to have here today. One of the things, and time has gone away so quickly today, but one of the things that that I want to make sure this house does not ever represent um, is, is the spirit of manipulation, uh, the spirit of, of control, and so forth. Matthew 24 has got a very good story. Let me read it to you and we'll close. Matthew 24, verse 45 to 51. I mean... You know, if you went to Matthew 24, it's interesting to take note that this is the, the scripture about the end times. Everyone say end times? The last days. And God will give you various stories about what will happen before he comes. And we all believe in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in that. But you know, this whole chapter closes 
with a very unusual story. It's found in verse 45, Matthew 24, 45. It says, I mean, if you read 43, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So there'll be, the Lord is coming back to his church. Okay, but look at how he closes the story. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household? Look at the language. Well, we are like servants. I'm a servant to you even though I'm a representative father. But who's wise? Who's faithful? Who's trustworthy, credible, reliable? Who is it? Who is a person that understands prudence? Who is sagacious? Who is, who is somebody that understands the deeper things of God? This is how God is going to value and estimate the leadership of individuals. Who is the faithful and wise, intelligent, prudent, mindful servant? Um, whom his master made ruler over his household, his, his family. Uh, or, and the concept is to domestically rule over his family. To give them, listen to this, listen to this. So the only way you rule the family is to give them food in due season. So before the Lord comes, he's going to come to visit the church or churches his households, where he will study leaders that are managing the family of his domestically. And he's going to look for faithfulness and he's going to look for, he's going to look for intelligence in the spirit. But such an individual is going to focus on the primary thing, which is, is that guy feeding the family correctly? Because, you, because God understands something. The final mandate that God gave to Peter in a post-resurrection, from a post-resurrection perspective was, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And then Peter said, you know I love you. And, and Jesus said, feed. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. Okay, or tend my sheep. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. What's the point? God's not interested in, in anything else but how you are being fed. Because we become what we eat. We become. Look at what it says here. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Okay, so if we are expectant of the Lord, that's the only thing we should be doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all these goods. If... We can bring this, and this principle can apply to all of you. If you are faithful in making sure you take care of the people in your environment, by feeding them right, by taking care of them right, God will promote you. God will increase your sphere. I've seen cruel people that live for themselves. I've seen leaders of churches that just live for the tides of the church. I've seen manipulative patterns of behavior where we've ex become extortionist of God's people. I mean, you talk about extortion in the world system, it's more in the church. It's more in the church. We can't have this. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, manipulate them, treat them badly, and so forth, and to eat and drink with the drunkards, get corrupted by the world system. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Therefore, sh there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know, but the end time church, there's going to be a visitation of God. And I want to think that this house will be a very, very, a house that is true. 
and genuine and sincere a house where when people come here even if they knocked on our door in the wee hours of the morning there's always bread in our house for the visitor are you understanding what i'm saying uh, uh, and we're ready to serve people because we have the bread of heaven with us and obviously this house has become a house that that exports or shares the grace the word of god with the nations of the world come let's stand yeah i'll close the series next week on patriarchal blessings i want to talk about the blessings of fathers next week all right but just just bow your heads before the lord ask yourself the question you may be female also but don't, you know i'm talking about when i talk about fathering i'm talking about the spirit of god that comes upon us male and female but ask yourself the question am i a good representation of my father ask yourself then have i disconnected myself from the spirit of father sometimes if you just study your environment you'll know whether you're a father or not it's not how much you earn i hope you know that by now it's how you trust your father with the little you have you know you can have a boy's lunch in your hand but it'll multiply if you know the spirit of fathering this is an amazing grace the spirit of fathering in fact wherever the spirit of the father is there is no lack that's fathers are known by the principle that there will be no lack come let's let's press let's press into this reality let's push through the crowd let's let's do what the widow did knock 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 prevail 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 until until we get to the source that generates the blessings that make rich and add no sorrow so lift your hands to the lord and say lord help me i want the spirit i want that spirit to baptize me to saturate me to fill the environment in which i live sharamanda rabasikat katala mandala basikat karamanda rabasikat shelemende lebesikat karabanda rabasikat shelemende lebesikat kalabanda labasikat Father we need the revelation of who you are in our lives so not only would would we receive it but we would become revelators of it that we will not just be custodians of your grace upon us but we will be stewards of it you have freely given to us so that we can freely share what you've given with others and today lord i'm asking for this spirit to come upon us most of us have been abandoned by fathers in the spirit and many of us are orphans but today we refuse to live in a place of lack we want to come back to you and know you as our father so that we could become the most exact representation of you to the world the world is dying father the earth is cursed there's no true love out there anymore yet you've shared your love in our hearts by your spirit now father help us to share this love with the world as you have given us help us to give it to others at the workplace that we live in will be impregnated with the grace of the spirit of fathering i bless this house today i pray that the more they stay in the shadow of this your presence 
the more they would become the objects through which you would communicate your grace with others. Fill us with this love, Father. Fill us with this love. Help us to be what you've called us to be. I'm praying also, Father, that this, the evidence of your presence amongst us will translate into dry places becoming fertile, rivers flowing in the desert, rain falling where no rain was supposed to fall, and that there be a harvest of provision amongst us, not because of the salaries we earn, but because we are plugged in correctly, positioned correctly. Some of us, Father, have been striving, 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 conniving, trying to make things happen, looking for opportunities and nothing seems to be happening. Maybe today you've spoken to us and helped us to understand that the problem is not with the provision. The problem is with connection to the source. So help us to connect to you, Father so that there can be a translation of this in every facet of our lives. Oh, we bless you. We bless you. Take your communion as we sing a song together. Go ahead and share it and ask God to help you in these areas that we spoke about.